Isn't it amazing just to focus on the cross and just how much it's achieved? We're forgiven and we're, we're freed. Right. Gary Lineker's back on TV. I thought I'd use this picture because um, Richard used this picture a few weeks ago when he was talking on the subject of listening. And uh, this morning we are talking all about how God speaks. And we don't necessarily need ears quite that big to, to hear, hopefully. <laughs> um, but what I want to get across to you today is that God speaks, and he speaks even in the middle of pain and confusion and whatever you're going through. And if, if we learn to listen, when we truly listen, we can have great faith. We can truly grow. We can overflow with praise in whatever circumstance. And uh, it's, it's been so good to sing so much of the cross this morning because I'd like to show you how even in this passage in Habakkuk, which at first read seems a little bit of a downer, leads us back to the cross, back to the wonder of the love of Jesus. So all of this is in the uh, context of our, of our long-term vision as a church that we're daring to believe that this whole town could get saved and transformed, that revival could come here. Why not? God is the God of the impossible. And that the church across Rusley could become the house of prayer for all nations that, that Jesus said he wants it to become. And that together we could really truly be the royal priesthood, royal in our identity and going out and advancing the kingdom for his glory. Big vision, long way off probably. And so we have this medium-term vision, medium vision leading up to it, really underpinned by prayer, by truly, uh, radically, joyfully obeying the commands of loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength, loving each other and making disciples, underpinning all of that with prayer, with spirit and truth. So we, we're radically grounded in Scripture and we have the power to go out and make it a real thing in people's lives. But before we get onto all of that, the thing that has to has to be our starting point is prayer and so we have this vision this year um, to be united in encountering Jesus so that others encounter him through us and it's all about prayer presence and listening PPL um, and these three things are just so intertwined so 2600 years ago a bloke called Habakkuk wrote a book what's that got to do with our vision here, what's that got to do with prayer? How can that help us in Rugeley in 2023 and wherever we are if we're, if we're listening on YouTube? Well, let's have a look. So uh, if you'd like to turn to Habakkuk, um, as Bob said, one of the best ways of getting there is to open your Bible on the contents page. Or you could go to Matthew. If you know where Matthew is, go back five short books and you'll find it around there. Or cheat and put your bookmark in there before you come. We're going to read um, the first four verses um, that start with this. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. The oracle is not the shopping center where me and Liz spent many a happy time in our courtship in Reading. It is um, a, a burden. And in, in the context of a prophet, it's a burden that's being released to the people. So this is the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. And he is saying to God, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear or cry to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. That's where we got to last time. And you could say that, that Habakkuk's problem, really, is... On the one hand, he's got God, everything that God says he is, all his promises. And then on the other hand, he's got this reality around him. Now, isn't that our problem today? Can you immediately see there is a real clear relevance to this book? And that's what Richard was talking about last week. You see all the wickedness and the confusion and the problems in the world, whether it's globally, nationally, locally, or even within ourselves. And you compare it to God's goodness and his promises. You're like... There seems to be a large gap. And in Habakkuk's day, things were, things were pretty bad. Uh, Bob gave us some context to this two weeks ago. The, uh, the, 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 the nation of Israel, it was, 
had these amazing promises to, to be blessed by God and then to be a blessing to all the nations. Uh, and after King David, after King Solomon, things had gone a little bit awry and the nation had split in two and you've got Israel in the north, you've got Judah down in the south. And Israel had had this succession of kings and if you look at whether they were good or evil in God's sight, it was a pretty bad list. Evil, 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 mm. evil, evil, evil. Until they get defeated and carted off into captivity by the Assyrian Empire, who is the big kind of ruling force in the world at the time. So it's not gone well for Israel in the north. How about the south? Well, kind of a little bit better. Judah, um, it's had kind of some good kings. It's had time of revival. Um, but again, if you look at the list of kings, I listed them out here. I thought this is quite interesting. Whether they did good or evil in God's sight, it goes like this. Evil, evil, good, good, evil, 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 mixed, mixed, good, good, evil, good, evil, evil, good, evil, 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 evil. <laughs> gone. Not so good. And Habakkuk, uh, his time is around the time of that last good king and into those uh, evils towards the end. And, um, well, spoiler alert, uh, yes, another invading force comes in and off go Judah into uh, captivity as well. Not good. And at the time of Habakkuk's day, it's, it's really going south. It's not good. And um, in Jeremiah chapter 5, it says, for the house of Israel and the house of Judah have been utterly treacherous to me, declares the Lord. They have spoken falsely of the Lord and have said, he will do nothing. No disaster will come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. That's where the people are at. I think a lot of people in the world, ditto now. This is our lives. We're in control. We can do whatever we want. And so the people of Habakkuk's day, they are, they are kind of glib, they are ignorant, they are arrogant, they are, we don't need God. But Habakkuk is shaken about this, he's shaken, and it stirs him into action, shaken and stirred. James Bond would not have liked that drink, but it has stirred him, and what action has it stirred Habakkuk into? Crying out to God, prayer, and I just think, isn't this interesting that God often lets circumstances get so bad, <laughs> we eventually end up on our knees in prayer. I wonder what would have happened if we'd started there and our lifestyle was on our knees in prayer, complete surrender to God. Habakkuk gets so desperate, he's driven to his knees in prayer, and that's what this, this book is. It's kind of similar to um, the psalm that I talked about back in... Um, uh, that when I released the, the vision uh, a few weeks back, a psalm that had blessed me last autumn, Psalm 73, Asaph had got so cross about all the wickedness around him, and he, he said, Lord, I try to understand this, and it seems to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Hmm, in interesting if he'd gone into the sanctuary of God to start with, or maybe just lived from that presence. Uh, how long had he spent feeling so wearisome about it? So that's why prayer is just so important to everything we do. If we're starting with prayer, this prayer, this presence, this listening, this relationship, this two-way thing with God. So we, we see in this, it starts off with Habakkuk speaking. But what I wanted to really get across today is God speaks. God speaks. So do you want to hear God speak? Yes, okay. Shall we hear him speak? Where are we on the screen? Oh, here he is. So God's reply to Habakkuk. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Habakkuk's like, oh yes, come on, bring it on, bring it on, this sounds good. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. What? Habakkuk's thinking, I, uh, <clears throat> come in, sorry who march through the breadth of the earth to seize their dwellings, not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. Just remember that verse. That's going to be significant later. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. 
guilty men whose own might is their God. Oh, pants. It's probably Habakkuk's exact words. God's spoken, but it sounds pretty bad. Is this God? Does he know what he's doing? God's going to raise up the Chaldeans, and what you don't know yet from this passage is he's going to raise them up against his own people. How can this be a good thing? And the Chaldeans, they're this people group who for, for many years have been like a thorn in the side of the Assyrian Empire. They've taken Babylon a couple of times, and as the Assyrian Empire starts to break up, the Chaldeans are just perfectly placed as part of this big Babylonian Empire, now just sweeping through. And again, spoiler alert, it's going to come through, and it's, it's going to defeat the, uh, the, the people of Judah, destroy Jerusalem, and off they go into captivity. And so Habakkuk's thinking, how does this help? How does raising up the Chaldeans help God, what are you doing? Do you even know what you're doing? It's a bit like being at a football match. This often happens at uh, the villa, uh, <laughs> where the crowd starts singing, you don't know what you're doing. And sometimes they're singing that to the ref, and sometimes to the manager, sometimes to the players, sometimes to each other. We don't know what we're doing here. But it's quite interesting, because if you take a step back, we know a lot more than Habakkuk. We, we've got this whole Bible. We can see the context. We can see that actually, eventually, good comes out of this. And I think it's really important that God says, I am raising up the Chaldeans. This is a, just a, a powerful thing about God's sovereignty. The biggest force in the world at the time, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, he's, they're, they're still reporting to God. They, they still can't do anything unless God lets them. And, it, and again, spoiler alert, there's a number of spoilers in here. Um, a little bit later in Habakkuk, we see... God says, I'm also going to destroy them. So this is all about God speaking. Prayer is two-way. Habakkuk has spoken, and God's amazing. He promises that when we speak to him, he listens. It may not feel like it at times, but it's a promise. He hears, he listens. But equally so, when he speaks, we need to listen. And I just found, as I was studying this through the week, I found, isn't this amazing that God's spoken here in Habakkuk and it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, and it doesn't seem good. But what we've got to learn is that it comes in the context of everything that God says. Because God has been speaking to his people from the start. Speaking to Adam and Eve, giving them amazing promises. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. God has been speaking to, to Noah. What's going to happen with your descendants? With um, Abraham, you're going to have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. I'm going to make you into a nation. And... To, to Jacob, to, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph, and so on. This promise, you're going to become this great nation. I'm going to bless you, and through you, I'm going to bless the nations. God's been speaking to them all these things all the time. And to Moses, he speaks so much. We read through it in the Old Testament. And he speaks the whole law, this law that because Israel has come out of captivity in Egypt, they need law to help them become a civilized society, to, to prepare them to go into the promised land so they can honor each other, they can function well for God's glory, they can look after this land, steward it well, and become this blessing to the nations. And God has spoken so much to help them with that. And that would then fulfill God's promises if they listen. And so if you turn back with me into, further back into the Old Testament to Deuteronomy chapter 28... This is where I just find this gets more and more fascinating. Because this is God speaking again. Do you want to hear God speak again? Here we go. Deuteronomy 28, God is speaking. This is all part of, of giving the law to Moses that's going to bless and help the people. Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, there it is, the voice, God speaking, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. You're going to get a lot of blessing. And this chapter, it keeps going on about, the, about amazing things happening. Um, so much blessing. Verse 7, the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Verse 9, the Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself as he has sworn to you. 
if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Blessings for obedience, great blessings. Just keep doing this, guys, and everything's going to be good. But then God makes it very clearly, uh, very clear again, verse 15. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all of these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Now he lists all the opposites. In verse 25, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and you shall be a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. And it keeps going. It gets, it gets worse and worse. Verse 47, it's not on the screen, but it says, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, because of the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Verse 49, the Lord will bring a nation against you from far away. Sound familiar? From the end of the earth, swooping down like the eagle. There's the verse. God actually quoted this verse, quoted himself in Habakkuk 1, verse 8. A nation whose language you do not understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or show mercy to the young, and it just keeps on going and going. It's just made really, really clear. Listen to the voice of God and obey, and everything's going to go so well. Not just you're going to be all right. It's going to be amazing. But if you're going to ignore God, who's the source of all good and everything that you need, things are not going to go well. And this just completely predicts what then happens throughout the rest of the Old Testament. That's exactly what happens when they obey God and they listen to God. Amazing blessing. And the opposite is true as well. And what I find really interesting is that King Josiah, he was the last good king in Judah. When I listed evil, 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 good, 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 good. That last good one. During his reign, he was trying to do a bit better. And uh, I think Bob mentioned this two weeks ago. During his reign, they found the book of the law, which means the book of the law had been lost for, for how long? No wonder the nation was in absolute disarray. They found exactly what we just read in Deuteronomy. And when Josiah read it, it says he tore his clothes in anguish. This is in 2 Kings 22. Because he's like, oh no. If we'd obeyed God and listened to his voice, then we could have had all of this good stuff. But we haven't been. Oh, pants. And he, he brought in some reforms, and, uh, but it, it was too little too late. You ended up with those four more evil kings, and then we know what happens next. And again, you have to step back and go, but we've got the whole lot. We've got Deuteronomy. We've got Habakkuk. We've got the Gospels. We've got the whole Bible. We know what happens. If we continue listening to God's voice in this, we know what happens. We get to Revelation. Revelation, for all of its um, apocalyptic um, imagery and stuff, is basically just the headline, Jesus wins. <laughs> we know the end. It's like um, knowing the result of your, of your favorite team's football match. Say they won 4-3, and then you go and watch the highlights, and it's 3-0 down at half time. And if you didn't know the final score, you'd be like, oh, forget this. You don't know what you're doing. Uh, maybe switch it off. But you endure through that because you're like, I know by the end it's going to be 4-3. So I can cope through this, and I'm looking forward to seeing how we get there. We actually have that situation now in, in our lives. We know the end. We know Jesus has won on the cross. We know we win with him. And therefore, everything that happens around us and everything God's saying to us can be in that context. And it was, it was really interesting on, on Wednesday, um, I was starting to uh, prepare this and uh, Rachel Kisley, um, was, she's part of our house group and she sat there and she said that when she had cancer, serious cancer, obviously every fiber of her being, she wanted to get rid of that evil, that horrible, awful cancer. But she can look back and say that cancer, because of that, I came back to church for the first time since I was 11. I started praying. I came back into the church family, and now I have a relationship with God. And then God got rid of it. God let the Chaldeans come up, and then he destroyed them. And at the time, it made no sense. She went through chemo, mastectomy, 
great anguish and worry and pain. But God had a plan. God is sovereign. God knows what he's doing. So if you're in the middle of something now, listen to what God's saying. It's all in scripture. It's all here. God speaks. And not only does he speak, but back in Habakkuk, he prefaces it by saying, I am doing something astounding. Wonder and be astounded. I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. He's saying, I'm doing something and it's astounding. Don't miss it. Don't panic if to start with it doesn't look good. And this is where it brings us back into the gospel. This is where I get really excited. <laughs> like, yes. We started with the cross in worship, and this brings us back to the cross now. Because in the book of Acts in the New Testament, Paul, he's speaking to a synagogue full of Jewish people in Antioch, and he quotes this verse. So if you'd like to turn to Acts chapter 13. It's just amazing to think in Habakkuk's day, the biggest thing that was missing was Jesus and the cross. The people got punished. The people went through all of that horrible stuff with no hope. We have Jesus and the cross. And it says in Hebrews chapter 1, it says, where God used to speak through the prophets, now he speaks through his son. He's, and that's through Jesus himself. It's through Jesus' blood on the cross. Hebrews 12, 24 says his blood speaks, and it speaks mercy to sinners and forgiveness. So if you turn to Acts chapter 13, verse 38. This is Paul speaking to this um, Jewish synagogue. He's saying, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. These are the descendants of the people of Habakkuk's day. And by him, everyone who believes is freed and in the Greek, it's justified. I always remember my dad saying, what does justified mean? It's like saying, just as if I'd never sinned. Justified, never sinned. When we come to Jesus and believe and accept him as our savior, it's just as if we'd never sinned. What? So by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses, that law we were reading before. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. And here we get Habakkuk 1, verse 5. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. He's saying, look, guys, look. Be astounded. God is doing an amazing thing. What's that amazing thing? Jesus, the Messiah, is here. He has come to take the punishment for your sins, to make a way through where for thousands of years you have not found a way through, and you've gone round and round and round, and you've had blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. Look, don't miss it now. Be astounded. The Messiah is here. He has come. Come to him. Know him. Don't leave it too late. The temple's going to get destroyed again. It gets destroyed a few years later in AD 70. And again, this, this just gives me great wonder because I think, think back to Deuteronomy that we just read in chapter 28. It said you get blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. It becomes quite evident to us, none of us are obedient, are we? <laughs> in claiming that we're obedient, we're being disobedient, ironically. But none of us can actually meet that whole law. But with Jesus... We get eternal blessing through his obedience. He gets cursed because of our disobedience. <laughs> I, that's been astounding me all week. When we come to him, we get eternally blessed with relationship with him forever because of his obedience. He obediently went to the cross as the only perfect sacrifice, the only one who perfectly met the whole law. And he became a curse because of our disobedience, because of our sin. Oh, the wonder of the cross. They didn't have that in Habakkuk's day. We've got that now. The Old Testament, it just constantly points to Jesus. When you read it, if you just say, show me Jesus, every passage, every verse, there is Jesus whether it's um, just how bad things have got and how much they need Jesus, or it's a, f a sign of Jesus to come, a forerunner, um, or it's, it's something saying hope is coming. It's all about Jesus. And we know that famous verse, all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. 
And it's through him we say amen for his glory. It's Jesus. It just, everything points us back to Jesus and the cross. That's where he wants to point us back to. And we get there in prayer because that's where we truly listen. God speaks and we listen. Listen to the wonder of the cross. And then it means if we're in Habakkuk's position, like we've said we kind of are, when we look at all the wickedness around us, now we can cry out with the power of the cross that the power of the cross will come and heal our land. The power of the cross will come and save. If that wickedness is, is affecting us, if we're on the receiving end of that wickedness, we can call out the power of the cross to help us forgive where we have been hurt and messed around by that wickedness because he forgave us on the cross. Where we see that wickedness in ourselves, we can throw ourselves on the grace and the mercy at the cross, his blood shed at the cross that cleanses us. We can cry out in thankfulness, in gratitude, thank you for taking my punishment at the cross. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the grace and the mercy to deal with the consequences of my actions. And if the circumstances around us are challenging and don't make sense and confusing, we can go back to the cross and say, God, thank you that you will work things together for good. How do you want to grow me? How do you want to refine me? How do you want to make me more like you? Which is only possible because of the cross. Hallelujah. All of that is prayer. All of that starts with prayer and us listening to God. And we cry out back to him and we keep on listening. Don't miss what God is doing. If things suck at the moment, he's still saying, I'm doing something astounding. Hang on in there. My promises are good. It does come good. He wants revival even more than we do, but he wants to revive us. It's a revival, a reformation in us and in the church before it spreads outward and heals our land. And um, if I could just have, um, I had a picture of the cross with a quote on it. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading on prayer, and I came across this, this quote, um, which I really like, just in the context of today. When you teach people to pray, you teach them to triumph. It's the prerequisite to a victorious, overcoming Christian life. We're learning to pray at the moment, aren't we? Through the prayer course, through each other, through our preaching, and we'll keep coming back to that all year because we want to triumph. Do you want to triumph? You want to triumph in life? Does it feel like you're triumphing in life at the moment? Well, prayer is the prerequisite. That means a condition that is needed for something to happen, the prerequisite to a victorious overcoming Christian life. I want to live a victorious overcoming Christian life. Every single one of us can. Right through the pain, right through the suffering, together we can. Do you want to live that together? Yeah? Yeah? Little bit of little bit of a victorious overcoming Christian life, yes please. Well it starts with prayer, which means we're on our way. We're on our way to it. We're taking those first little baby steps. We're praying. This is an astounding thing. God is doing it. So there we are. We started by saying Habakkuk's frustrated with the difference between what he sees and God's promises, and we can relate with that. Well, I invite you, put the cross in the middle. And it all makes so much more sense. Let it bring you to your knees and pray. Let gratitude pour out. Thank you, God, you made a way through. Let intercession and petition, like we were hearing about in the prayer course this week, let that come out as a result to it because of the cross and keep listening to Jesus. Yeah? And spoiler alert, the more Habakkuk does that, the more he listens, the more it starts to translate into faith and worship. And that's where we're going. God is moving. It's astounding. Don't miss it. Amen? Amen. Good word. Now, I think, Jane's still here, could we sing a song about the cross, even if it's just he lives again? As we sing that, just, um, just let just the power of the cross, just let it sink in. I'm forgiven, I'm redeemed, I'm restored. I don't see the finished work in me yet, but it has happened if I have given my life to Jesus. And if you haven't given your life to Jesus, do it today. Do it today. Don't leave it another day. That's what Paul's saying in Acts. Don't leave it too late. Because at the moment, your sin is separating you from God. And if you do it today, 
you get to know this joy of the power of the cross. You get to know his blood cleansing you from all sin. You get to know the start of abundant life, of victory, of reigning with him. Don't leave it too late. Do it today, I urge you. And if you do know him and you want you just need a bit of a spiritual kick up the backside and just say, yeah, I want to do this. I want to just put the cross central. Then as we're singing, maybe just come forward or come to the side here and we'll just pray a blessing. We'll just say the power of the cross. Holy Spirit, come. Just, just do more of your amazing work. So, yeah, Jane and... Um, I was going to call you Gabriella. That's weird. Amelia. <laughs> if you could come forward and lead us in worship. Let, let the, the words of it minister to you. Uh, oh, yes. And we'll...